finding jobs, putting bread and butter on the table. Secondly, their concern about the safety and health and education of their children. And thirdly, they are thinking very seriously about having the right to vote and to turf out the rascals if they don't like them. <laughs> and the article ends up by saying, my gosh, there are people like us. <coughs> the area has many challenges, like any other part of the world. And I really like to talk about a few of them before I address the issue of education, American education. One of the things that has been said about the area is that there is poverty, there is a lack of education, and there is a lack of empowering women. And that's very, very important because if we go back to history a little bit, what we find out is really that poverty and ignorance brought communism to Eastern Europe. That ignorance and poverty brought civil wars to Latin America. <coughs> that poverty and ignorance is responsible for some of the activist movements in the MENA region. And if we try really to go back to the history of the involvement of the United States in that part of the world, we find that it went through three major phases. It began with the missionaries going to that part of the world in order to convert Muslim population. And when they did not succeed, thank Thank God they opened schools. The second phase was really economic phase. The oil and its implication. And the third phase really was a political phase. And all three phases were combined together in the way things happened in that part of the world. Further to that, if you analyze the population of that region, you realize that there are about 60% of the population is under 30 years of age. And the majority of those are under the age of 20, which is very, very important. The other thing that is characteristic of that area is related to education. And that's very, very important because it seems to us that the whole pedagogical thrust in the area is really focused on employment with government. And that is no longer the case because government can no longer provide jobs forever. So there is really a disconnect, if you will, and I'm speaking generally here, between the goal of education in general and what's happening with government and in the market. Very, very important. And the final comment I want to make in this regard is the fact that people talk really about knowledge gap. And that was a major, major point that was reported in the UNDP uh, report, which was appeared, which appeared about five years ago. And that was very, very important. It spoke to some very, very specific areas that, uh, that were lacking in education. That leaders in that part of the world, especially leaders in education, had to pay attention to it. Let me address the issue of, of American education in the area. And that's a very fascinating history. 
As some of you might know, there are three American institutions in the Arab world. That is three real American institutions. They are like any other American institution within the United States. Those institutions are governed by American education laws, be it in the state of New York or federally. And these institutions are the following. I'm going to spend some time going over them. Let me begin by AUB, American University of Beirut. In 1862, the Board of Commissioners for Foreign Mission in New York decided to ask Daniel Bliss to really start an American school in Beirut. And the instructions to him was that it had to be patterned on the American system of education. It had to be a liberal arts institution. And in 1866, 67, the Syrian Protestant College was commenced, began operating in Beirut, and later on it became known as the UB American University of Beirut. I'll come back to this a little later on. The second American institution in that area is AUC, American University of Cairo. And that institution was established in 1919 for the purpose of providing American education in Egypt and in having that institution connect with society. That is, engagement of the university in the Egyptian society. And that was done. And the third institution is my own institution, LAU, Lebanese American University. Now there's a history to that institution that goes back to 1834. 1834, when a missionary by the name of Eli Smith came back from the Near East, as it was called at that time, and began to give reports about his own experience throughout cities in the United States. He arrived to Norwich, Connecticut. And while he was giving his report, there was a young woman sitting in the audience. A young woman of fame, of riches. His name, her name was Sarah Huntington. And it is that Sarah, the same Sarah Huntington, who really opposed Andrew Jackson when he issued his famous or infamous edict saying that all the non-civilized nations must be ostracized west of the Mississippi. Well, in Norwich, there was an Indian tribe, the Mohegans, and she said, by George, I'm not going to allow that to happen. She spent money, she raised money, she opened a school for the Mohegans and a church. And as a result of that, they were considered as civilized people and they were not asked to leave their land. Very, very important. So, when she was listening to Eli Smith, she liked what he had to say. So after the report, she sat down with him, and interestingly enough, she fell in love with him. And she told him, I want to go back with you to that area. He said, well, look, you can't even really understand what's going on there. Why do you want to go back with me? She said, I am going back with you. I'm going to abandon everything here, and I'm going to go back with you. To make a long story short, in 1834, 
They sailed out of Norwich, Connecticut. It took them three months to get to Beirut. And when they got to Beirut, the first thing that she wanted to do was to establish a school for the education of women in the Ottoman Empire. And for those of you who are familiar with women's education in the United States, that school was established two years before Mount Holyoke was established in the United States. Very, very important. Well, a year and a half after she established the school, she received a message from her mother saying to her, your dad is very sick and he would like to see you before he dies. She jumped on a ship. Unfortunately, she had a shipwreck near Cyprus. They saved her. Unfortunately, she contracted a very bad disease and died. And she was buried in Izmir or Smyrna in Turkey and her tomb is there up to the present time. And that school began to grow and grow and grow. At the turn of the last century, it became known as American Junior College. And later on, it became known in the 1990s, I don't want to go through the whole history, as Lebanese American University. <laughs> With seven schools, including medicine, pharmacy, and, and, uh, and nursing, uh, liberal arts, engineering, architecture, and design, and the whole shebang. <laughs> and, and we have at the present time two major campuses, one in Beirut, the mother campus, and the other one is in the famous city of Biblos, which is about 37 kilometers north of Beirut. And we have 8,067 students, to be correct. Very, very important, really, uni American university along with the AUB in, in Beirut. Over and above that, you have a score of American-style institutions. Those are not institutions that are registered, chartered in the United States, but they have their curriculum, their teaching pattern after the American model. Very, very important. The third element that relates to American education is the American branch institutions that are rushing to the area establishing branches of their own institutions in the United States, from Cornell to other institutions, and they're there in the area. They're in Qatar, they're in uh, Kuwait, they're in the Emirates, uh, you name it, and they're there. And interestingly enough, they're going through a very, very interesting experience in, in that area. Now, the University of Sharjah, is an American institution. It's not a very old American institution, about 10 years, 12 years, but it is different from LAU, AUB, and AUC. Those institutions have been there for a long time. They are deeply rooted in the region, and, and uh, the pattern, uh, the, they're charted in the United States, uh, which is very, very important to, to keep in mind. Over and above those, there are a lot of American consultants, consultants on higher education, who are advising governments in the area, who are advising private institutions in the area, who are advising high schools in the area, in order to make sure that the American model is really implemented in a very, very effective way. Having described all of that, let me go over the specific of American higher education in the area. And the question that arises, of course, what has been the impact of American education, American higher education in, uh, in the area? There are three major, if you will, levels that I'd like to address. The first one relates to general American values of education. 
The second one I'd like to focus on more specifically is the whole notion of American liberal arts education. In the third level that I'd like to focus on for a bit is really American institutions as agents of change in the area. And all three, you know, are very, very important for our understanding of what American higher education or American education in general is doing in the area. Well, let me begin with the first one in terms of the general impact. What are those general values that we value so much in American higher education? Well, there are many of them, and I'll try to limit myself to a few. The first one, of course, is the notion, really, of the human dignity and the mutual respect that human beings have vis-a-vis -vis each other. It's, it's very, very important to keep that in mind, and that goes to the heart, really, of American education. The second one is really tolerance. That, uh, as you well know, diversity is looked upon within American higher education or American education in general as a source of strength, uh, as an enriching element in American higher education, which is very, very important. The third general value, if you will, is the whole issue of fundamental freedoms and human rights. The notion, really, of democracy that I will speak about a little later on, uh, which is very, very important. The, the responsible, if you wish, freedom of speech. And I underline responsible. It's very, very important to keep that in mind. Over and above that, I think American higher education has introduced to the area a certain degree of flexibility with the curriculum. I mean, you have students who are given really the choice to select, to select. The electives are very well known in American higher education, in American education in general. And that's very, very important. And that is really to give the students the opportunity not only to take the requirements depending on their fields of specialization, be it engineering or medicine or nursing or what have you, but to give them the opportunity to select a number of courses of their liking, which is very, very important. And, and, and hence, in a number of American institutions, uh, we have what we call the core curriculum, which is a very, very important component element of American education, American higher education. And, and I'll tell you what, at our institution, for example, no student can graduate, be it in engineering, in medicine, in nursing, in uh, architecture, in business, in you name it, without satisfying that requirement. They have to take a number of courses in the core area. And those courses are focused on the humanities, on philosophy, on ethics, on literature, which are very, very important because we need, as, as institutions of higher education, really to make sure that we graduate rounded people. That's very, very important, and I'll speak to this issue in a short, in a short while. So these are, are general values that maybe are not specifically taught, but they are reflected in the curriculum that we offer our students. And they're very, very crucial to the development of the individual. And I'll add one more thing, which is very, very important, and that's unique to American education, that we focus not only on academic excellence, which is very, very important, but equally important, we focus 
on the growth of the individual. You know, the education of the whole person is an American notion that you don't want to really graduate misfits for society, that people who are very, very bright, but when it comes to their natural, you know, to their personal uh, growth, to their personal maturity, it's not there. And therefore, if you don't have that balance between the two, then obviously the people who are graduating and going out into society cannot really do what we'd like them to do. It's very, very important. So the growth of the individual, the maturity of the individual, the poise, the self, you know, respect that people have, the self really, uh, if you will, uh, in, 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 in a way, the, the self-respect they have, not only for themselves, but for the others. And over and above that, there is the self-confidence, which is very, very important. Very important in, in American education. And, and uh, before I left, when I was still here in the United States, uh, we spent a lot of time, spent a lot of time with the accrediting agency talking about these issues, which is very, very important. These are general notions, general values that are reflected in the entire system. Let me speak for a bit about really what is meant <clears throat> by liberal arts education. It's very, very important, and I'm going to go through some specific, some specific, which is very important. Well, one of the things that we pride ourselves on as, as American institution is the fact that we give our students the opportunity to develop an analytical mind, which is very, very important. That we don't want our students really to, to learn by heart, word by word or for word, uh, what they're studying. But we need really to provide them with the opportunity, not what to think, but how to think, which is very, very important. We don't want our students to graduate only with skills. Skills are very, very important but we want them to graduate as educated people. And that education cannot come really from studying really and excelling and promoting the skills and how to fix, you know, a, a, a car or how to, those are very, very important. But we really need to graduate decision makers. Look, my dear friends, the world, the global village, need responsible decision makers. And in order to be a responsible decision makers, we really need to make sure that we graduate educated people. And that's what we mean by liberal arts education, which is very, very important. Very important. Of course, the education of women, the empowerment of women, goes to the heart of what we're trying to do. And that's very, very important. Our schools, our American schools, are engaged day in and day out in really eliminating illiteracy from amongst women, empowering women, helping women who are in prison. It's very, very important. Over and above these three things, there are two very, very important areas that are really part and parcel of American education. You know, when I first graduated, I used to say, well, university should not really be part of society because society would really sully up uh, what we stand for, the ideas and this. Well, I immediately, you know, very fast to change my mind that institutions of education, especially American education, must be part and parcel of society. They must really respond 
to the challenges that the global village is facing at the present time. And God knows, God knows how many challenges we have from the environment to hunger, to so, so many challenges. And it's very, very important for us to make sure that we are part of society and not set apart from society. We don't. The notion of the ivory tower is anathema for me. You may disagree with me, but I feel very, very strongly that institutions which are being funded by, you know, the public purse, let me put it that way, or indirectly through tuition, you know, through student tuition, we have a major responsibility to society. So outreach, civic engagement become very, very important, part and parcel of American education and what American education is doing in that part of the world in, in the MENA region. Very, very important. Let me talk a little bit about American institutions as being agents of change. As we all know, I mean, we get educated in order to go out and change the world for the better. And that's very, very important for all of us. For all of us. So while our students are going through the university, they're exposed to so many things. Well, chief among that are, are, of course, human wealth of creativity and knowledge. It's very, very important for our students to know a little, little bit about that. But while they're going through the system, the university or the school, they're learning a lot of other skills of how things are being done. Not only are they educated, but they're learning about a whole gamut of other things before they graduate. And let me talk about them a little bit. They are learning about governance. The notion of American education and American higher education is really based on the whole concept of governance. You know, people think that a president has a lot of power. There are so many centers of power within the institution. You have the faculty you need to deal with. You have the faculty senate that you need to deal with. You have the students and, of course, you have a lot of clubs that you need to address and listen to. You have the staff that you need to listen to. And the challenge really is to learn how governance takes place when you have so many bright people running around telling you every single moment how you should do your job. So the whole, the, while the students are going through that, watching that day in and day out, they're learning something that is absolutely crucial for their future. There's another, you know, important issue that, that is unique to American education, and that is the whole issue of financial aid and scholarship. That our institution are not, were not, Sarah Hunter and Smith did not give up everything, including her own life, to see our American institution turned into institution only, only for the education, education of rich people. So, as a result, we have not only the responsibility, but the obligation to make sure that those students who are qualified but cannot otherwise come to get to our institutions to get an education that is second to none do have the opportunity to do so. I'll just give you an example. Our institution 
and I'm sure AUB is the same, AUC is the same, the Sharjah is, you know, University is the same. We give every year $12 million. And this year we added $2.5 million for a total of $15.5 million in order to provide the opportunity for those who are bright, those prospective students who are bright but economically could not possibly come to our institution in order for them to come to our institution. When students see that, see what the institution is doing, and I tell them in no certain terms, when you graduate, you ought to make sure that you educate another person, which is very, very important. Financial aid, scholarships, in the way, you know, we understand that is something that is unique to the United States, to American education. And students, rich and poor, learn quite a bit from that. There's another characteristic that is unique to American education. A unique to everything, but I'm talking about, about American education, and that is philanthropy. You know, we, I went there and I began to talk to people about the importance of raising money for the university. Excellence is very expensive. Academic excellence is the most expensive of the whole lot. You know, you're talking about labs, you're talking about faculty, you're talking about equipment, and that can not only and solely be charged to students and their parents. So we promote philanthropy. We ask people to give, to give in order really to make sure that others have the opportunity to come and earn an education so that they can have a better life, which is very, very important, very important. There is another debate that goes within the walls of American institutions in the area. <clears throat> and that is access versus quality. I mean, it's a major debate in the United States, as, as we all know. And it goes on within the walls of, of American institutions in the area. Access versus quality. And one of the major, major, really, <coughs> contributions of American institutions <coughs> is the way they address quality assurance. You know, our institutions, American institutions, AUB, AUC, uh, LAU, we are accredited. Uh, our, our institution is accredited by NIAS, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. Uh, the the uh, AUC by mid middle states, uh, AUB by middle states, Sharjah is, is always, you know. So what we bring really to the environment is a focus on quality, which is very, very important. You cannot have quality when you have <clears throat> at the University of Cairo, just to give you an example, 255,000 students. How can you have quality when you have other institutions with 100,000 students? But we as American institutions are participating in the process of quality assurance and how to assure it, how to ensure it in the MENA region, which is a very, very important, really very important uh, contribution. Also within the walls of our institutions, <clears throat> there is another debate that is taking place, and that is whether we should educate for the market or we should educate for the sake of education. And this is a debate that's been going on for ages in the United States. Very, very important. 
So how do you reconcile both? The debate takes place amongst faculty, amongst students, amongst staff. And students listen to them. They learn from it quite a bit. And by the time they graduate and they become really alumni, and they have jobs, guess what? They become agents of change. In whatever job they have, whatever occupation, and if you take a look at graduates from American institutions, they occupy really the best positions in the region. They really advise the most thriving businesses in the area. They have an impact in terms of strategy and in terms of policy making. And that has a lot to do with making a contribution to helping society in that part of the world change for the better. Very, very important to keep that in mind. And, and guess what? American education, at least American higher education, has not lost its attractiveness. And you go to the area, <clears throat> people may disagree with American foreign policy, but, but they want their kids to go to an American institution and get an American degree, get an American education. It speaks volumes, volumes for the impact that the few American institutions we have in the area do have on the change that is taking place in the area. I mean, take a look at, 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 at in the entire Gulf, for example. The leading people who are advising government, who are advising the private sector, are graduate of American institution, American-style institution. It's very, very important. Very important to keep that in mind. And when I go to the Hill to really talk about this thing, and I tell our Congress people, look, our American institutions, perhaps, are doing a better job in terms of introducing change than perhaps our tanks and our airplanes. And therefore, we ask you, the Congress, to support American higher education in the area. Not only do I ask the Congress, but I ask you to vote for American education, because that's the only answer to the ills of that part of the world. I thank you for listening to me.